Let us draw to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just praise and thank you, Lord, that our, our souls can rest in you. And we thank you tonight, O Lord God, that you have provided this hour where we would receive your word for the sanctification and cleansing of your church, and again, to the glory of your name. We pray for ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts to receive, a willingness to eat off of this fresh bread of life that you have given us in your words of life. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we find ourselves back in Genesis chapter 2. Believe it or not, we're back here in Genesis 2. And I think we're going to be here for quite some time, actually. Uh, but we thank the Lord that He has taken us here again. And we continue our study on that very important institution, that holy institution of God at creation, the institution of marriage. And we know that marriage is a wonderful thing. It is a mark of God's love, a mark of God's care, His mercy, and His provision for man, made in His image and likeness. As we know that it is not good, God saw that it is not good that man be alone. And so mar marriage in itself is a mark of God's care for man. To consider man and determine that it is not good for him to be alone, therefore God would create for him a suitable helper, fit for him, then to bind him in holy matrimony with the woman that is taken from his side, and then placed into what we would call a marriage covenant, a bond, a bond where these two would share for the rest of their life in the sight of the living God. All in all, marriage is a mystery profound according to the Apostle Paul. And from the very beginning, we have clear sights of what marriage is and what it was in the mind of God when he placed Adam and Eve together in the Garden of Eden. This mystery that is so profound from the beginning referred to Christ and his redeeming love for his church. Hence, an excellent and godly marriage represents the relationship between our Redeemer and the redeemed. And so a lot is at stake when understanding the holy institution of marriage. It is a reflection of Jesus Christ himself. And so we aim that in our marriages, we would be a great reflection of Christ's love for his bride. We are then encouraged this evening as Christians to understand the will of God in our marriages, not only for our personal good, but for the glory of Christ's name. And up to this point, we have covered what the marriage relationship is. We have learned that marriage is a lifelong commitment, a relationship that is not temporary, but lifelong lasting. The Apostle speaks of this in Romans, that it is till death do you part. It is a relationship for the rest of your life, a relationship of intimacy and one of holiness. It is one where you set aside all previous uh, ties which hinder one's relationship with their marriage partner. Sharing in the joys, the pleasures, the hardships and difficulties of, of life together. And they seeking to maintain that intimate bond. Striving for oneness, unity. Giving time one to another, for one another. Being emotionally open. Praying together and worshipping the living God together. Always gathering around the Lord Jesus Christ and His holy words. Marriage in itself was never meant for two individuals to leave the presence of God or to live their marriage away from the will of God. Marriage, if we want to see it at its full beauty, is meant to be in line with the will of God, meant to consider God. Just like we, made in the image and likeness of God, we were not meant to live apart from Him. And so our marriages were not created so that we may have a bond away from God. Its fullness and its beauty is seen in God Himself. And so we learned that all together. And it is a relationship of holiness. We've specified a relationship of holiness where both are unashamed. Both are able to confess, both are able to forgive, both are able to wash one another's feet and live together without any sort of concealing of secrets. And so if marriage refers to Christ and the church, we are to consider the very grounds for which Christ came. 
And I think this is a very important uh, subject uh, before we could even go to the part where we consider the role of the husband and the wife. What will it do us, what good will it do us if pastor teaches you the role of a wife and a husband but not understand the grounds of marriage? And again, I repeat, if Christ, or sorry, if the marriage refers to Christ and the church, it is important for us to consider the very grounds for which Christ came for his church. Ask yourself, out of what did Christ come? What led him to live a faithful life as a faithful husband to his bride? To look beyond his bride's faults and sins, and then to die for her, and then cleanse her, and one day take her, uh, with him for all of eternity? The answer to that question, if you can answer that question, you would then understand the very grounds of a godly marriage. Well, what led our Christ to come for his bride is nothing but love. It was love that brought Christ down. Out of his love, he came for his bride even when she was stained and full of shame. It was out of love he died for her. It was out of love he washed her. And it is out of love he will return for her on that final day. And I say to you, that is the same grounds of a godly marriage. As simple as that may sound, it is something quite hard for us to remember to do. It is the commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. And why is it that we are reminded always to love? Because we are not a loving people, naturally. We love those who are close to us. We love those that land in our favor. And even those who land in our favor, we fail and lack even in the showing and expression of love. And so as basic and elementary as that sounds, that the grounds of a godly marriage is love, we must hear it again, for it is the very same grounds in which Christ came to die and save you from your sins. And there will be no excellent marriage, there will be no fruitful marriage, unless we understand why you were even placed together to begin with. And this is what I say in marriage counseling for those I marry in the will of God, and that is to remind them that, as 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, that there is love, faith, and hope, but the greatest of these is love. Well, why is it that love is the greatest? Well, it endures forever. It endures forever, and that love will continue on from eternity to eternity. And if we ever forget why we got married to begin with, because we are so... Um, clouded by the weaknesses of our own partners, we must remember Christ's love for ourselves, his church, and the reason why you said, I do, on the day that you were married. You love one another. What led our Christ to come for his bride is his love. Hear the words of the New Testament, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We all know that we are undeserving of Christ because of our great sins toward God. But yet, despite the great sins of his own people, out of his love, he could not um, help but express this great demonstration of love by sending his son. Though he had all the right to withhold that. He had all the right to not give us the gift of his son. But yet, out of his love... He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. John 15, 9, as the Lord spoke, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5, verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's quite clear all throughout the New Testament that out of his love, he came. Ephesians 5.2 As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5.25, his command to the 
for the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's a common uh, statement whenever you read in the New Testament, when Christ gave up himself for us, there is always that statement of his love for his church. We are not to forget that. There's a whole reason why the New Testament writers were inspired for us to read that time and time again. Christ's love for the church. What led our faithful husband to give himself up for us was his love, love for us. And this is the same grounds God meant the parties of the marriage covenant to stand on and live by. And this is the same for the husbands and the wives. Again, Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives. Titus chapter 2, when Paul instructs the elderly woman to teach the younger woman. He says, train the young woman to love their husbands. It goes back and forth. It is the will of God for husbands to learn to love their wives. That's why we're learning it tonight. It is the will of God for wives to love their husbands. It is the will of God. The 16th century Puritan, William Googe, wrote that that is true wedlock. When husband and wife are linked together by the bond of love. Is there true marriage? Is there true covenant relationship between two who share no love? But that true wedlock between a husband and wife are linked together by the bond of love. Why? Because under love, all, our, all other duties are included. Everything that we can discuss when it comes to our relationships with our spouses, our partners, all fall under that when love is present. And without love, no duty can be well performed. Do you believe that? In love, all other duties are included, and without love, no duty can be well performed. Uh, Paul says in Romans 13 verse 10, Love is the fulfilling of the law. And so great was the love of the Lord Jesus to fulfill the entirety of the law. And so less was our love that we cannot even come close to the fulfillment of the entire law. It is not that the law is flawed. It is that we do not love enough. And we cannot love as he has loved us in our fallen state. And so that principle, love, is the fulfilling of the law. It is that bond which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians 3.14 It is the glue that holds the covenant together. The unity together. And wherever love abounds, there you will see all duties wonderly performed. <clears throat> the role of the husband and the wife you will see excellently there because there is love present. Where love is absence, uh, absent, there you will see all duties neglected, all duties carelessly performed. It is not with maximum efforts. It is the coldness of one's heart toward their covenant partner. In the same respect, the Apostle Paul says that all things should be done in love. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 16.14 all things ought to be done in love. And I'm giving these points out to you because if Scripture teaches us to love our neighbor generally, then how much more is it emphasized our love for that one that God has brought us together with to become one flesh with? Remember, it was love that led the Lord Jesus to act in the ultimate and total goodness of His people. And so does love lead the man to act in all the good he can. Why evil is present is because of the absence of love. Why evil is present and why it is done one to another is because of the absence of love. Nothing but hatred fills the heart. And since our Lord Jesus was led of love to, total, to practice total goodness and to give that demonstration of total goodness, we too are instructed to pattern ourselves after our Lord. John 13, 34. 
A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. And so if love is that general duty we have for all men, and remember, even our enemies we are to love, then how much more should love be found between those who have been joined together? And so husbands are called and wives are called to be fervent and constant in their love, never dying, never fading, never growing cold. Neither the lack of something or the fading outward beauty or the weakness of your partner or the status change or the riches or the honors or the parents or the family ties will ever lessen or withhold or withdraw or even extinguish that love you share with your husband or wife. Where neither any excellency of another husband or another wife or another woman or another man should draw you away from the very love you have for your wife and husband. And so we know that this is attacked by, our evil, uh, by the evil one. It is on the line when it comes to preserving our marriages and relationships, our knowledge of this love of God for our own souls. This is a generation where there is such a crooked disposition where they cannot love but rather hate. And I tell you that if there is no love, it is surely hate. And even if it is not an expressed hatred, it is a hidden hatred. It's either one or the other. And even if you do not do murderous actions, if it is not express expressions of love, then it is the it is hatred that fills the heart. And many have given their own excuses as to why they are not able to love in such a way because of, of lack of their partners or weakness of their partners, maybe past pain and trauma caused by their partners, hence they are unable to give that full uh, expression of love to them. There is limitations. And so where there is no mutual love, there is no true happiness between those who share a marriage. No happiness for the one who hates and no happiness for the person who actually loves. It is an ongoing torment between the two. And how dreadful of a thought of being bound for life to an individual you have no affection toward for the rest of your life. And because they are unable to separate and divorce on biblical grounds, they remain together. And as I said earlier, to only become torments one to another. And for what purpose does ungodly marriages serve? Well, ungodly unions only serve the purpose of teaching the single to never enter a marriage like that. To never enter a marriage without pure love. To enter a marriage on any other reason than that which is true love. And so those who are in ungodly marriages that have nothing but hatred in their hearts... The word of God calls them to repent. To repent of their ungodly relationships which stand opposed to the very holy institution of God at creation. They are marring that very sacred union that is meant to reflect Christ and His church. That whenever anyone looks at such a marriage, it should... It's, it really grieves the heart of God and distorts our, our view of our Maker's love for His image bearer. And so I warn you, this is a big deal, husbands and wives. This is not something that we should look down upon. How we live in our, how we conduct our marriages reflects our Christ. Lest we trample under our feet God's favor in giving man a companion suitable and fit for him. Lest we trample under our feet that holy institution of marriage to demonstrate the, the love of God for us. And the only thing that can save ungodly marriages is the salvation of their souls. Which even means that the Christian, though redeemed, should learn to love 
and to be constant in such love in their marriages. For they've been married to Christ, which teaches us to be even more constant in our affections toward the one that God has given us. It is only the salvation of their souls where they come to understand forgiveness, genuine repentance, and confession of sins, looking beyond faults, hurt, and pain, taking away hatred and exchanging it for nothing but pure love. <clears throat> Again, that is the point. Christian marriages, our marriages, should never be found on the grounds of hatred, but of pure love. Remember the words of John, the apostle in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. What does he say? Beloved, let us love one another. For what? For love is from God. It even goes as far as your being connected with God, being in relationship with God. Why? What does he say after? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. You hate your spouse? That is a great revelation of who you are in the sight of God. You hate your neighbor? That is a great insight to who you are in your relationship with God. Because it says, and anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So for the Christian marriage, what keeps the two together is not because they're just so good at being mutual and understanding one to another. Though those are all part of it. What keeps a Christian marriage together is their union with Christ. For that growing love for the Lord Jesus Christ from one party of the marriage covenant to the other will then produce in that marriage nothing but what Christ is doing in the heart of the husband or the wife. If the husband is growing in his love for Christ, then he will walk in love and express that great love Christ has expressed to him toward his wife. And if the wife is growing in love for Christ, then she too will express her love that Christ has taught her toward her husband. And so most of the times when there is an unloving act or an unloving word or an unloving thing that has been done, it's because there was a neglection and a blurring of our sights of Christ. Amen? This is the first to be understood. And then we can learn about the role of the husband and wife. Love. Why? Because it will all be vain regulations in the ear of him who has no love. Ah, so the husband should provide. So the husband should lead his wife. So the husband should love his wife. He needs to take care of his children. But all of that will be vain regulation if there's no true love. And the same thing for the wife. So I ask you, husbands and wives, can you wholeheartedly say... As your spouses are here, your marriage partners are here, without hypocrisy, husbands that you love your wives and wives that you love your husbands. No, not just every yearly anniversary, <clears throat> but every moment. Can you say without hypocrisy, not just by word, that you love your wife and your husband? We just need to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and we will come to examine whether our words are true. I'd like us to read there 1 Corinthians 13, please. Many people have different definitions of what love is, but love is not subjective. Love is God. And therefore, we should not um, run away from the very source of love himself, the very definition of love being God. What I love about this chapter is that the beginning verses take to our minds the very precious gifts of the church. 
And, I wa- and the reason why the apostle says this is because the Corinthian church looked at spiritual gifts so highly. Anyone who spoke tongues, they, uh, they admired. Anybody who prophesied, they admired. And Paul is putting all these spiritual gifts up here. And he is saying that without love, all of those things are garbage. And that's where he takes us when we read in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, uh, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. This is always something that convicts me as one who studies the Word of God always um, in my preparation for the church in feeding the sheep of God. It is always a reminder to me in my examination of my own marriage. Is it, is, am I just a man of knowledge? A man who understands the mysteries of Scripture? How is my marriage like? How do I treat my wife? How do I treat my children? And how do I treat the church? That's always a balance, that, or that is always something I think about when thinking about the role of the pastor, the role of the father, the role of the husband. Especially for those who have been given knowledge of the Holy Scriptures and go in depth in, in, depth in study. What does your knowledge of the Word of God lead you to do? For if it does not lead you to love those around you, as Paul said, you are just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He even goes as far as saying that I am nothing in verse 2. And so love here is not the enormous library of knowledge. Paul goes on to discuss what this is. He even says, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. But what does he say? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. And he goes on to say, bear, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So, in a nutshell, we see that genuine love is not and does not. Paul writes his description in that way. Genuine love is not and does not bring sinful offense leading to contentions. Love is not and does not insist on its own way. That's in verse 5. Love is not and does not rejoice in evil. Verse 6. Rather, in application to our marriages, love is and does bear all things. What does that mean, to bear all things? to excuse and to forgive the faults of your spouse. Now, when Paul uses this, he uses two different and but yet similar um, descriptions. He first goes on to say, bears all things and then later endures all things. They are quite similar, but used in different contexts. The first is, of course, irritations and annoyances. And that endures all things refers to all threatenings and oppositions and all... Um, uh, Deaths that may be brought to one's relationship. But in the context of marriage, love is and bears all things, which is to excuse and to forgive all the faults of your spouse. Looking over the annoyances of your spouse, looking over the burdens of your spouse, always willing to carry and to take the load upon your shoulders. Remember, you are one flesh, according to Genesis 2.24. And Ephesians 5 tells us that no man has ever aided his own body. That is to say that we, in that one flesh union, are to assume the very burdens of our marriage partners. 
Again, that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And no man has ever hated his own body. And hating your spouse is hating yourself. Because you are one flesh. The harm you do to your spouse, you do to yourself. The hurt you cause in her heart and his heart will have its consequences unto you. Most of us will be found on the couch or no food to eat. But those are just small things. There are deeper things. The very scars and wounds that you place in the heart of your marriage partners will then delay one's willingness to be open, one's willingness to trust, one's willingness to believe all things, as Paul says later on. But love is and does bear all things, which means you are willing to take the load no matter how annoying or irritating or how weak your partner in marriage may be. Because the person that you are married to is not perfect. Again, we've already eliminated the thought that when God has brought two together, that your marriage partner is the perfect one. That's not true. But they are suitable. They are fit for you. But they too, if not already redeemed, must be redeemed. And if redeemed, must be further sanctified until glory. So in our marriage, or the love of the one flesh love is a love that bears all things patiently. And again, we remember the Lord Jesus Christ and His love for us. How He bore our sins. How He patiently, though He could have consumed us in His wrath, patiently bearing our sins, taking it, the sins of the world, upon His shoulders, Nailing it to his cross. My sins. Your sins. Paul continues on. Love is and does believe all things. Which is to always take the words of your spouse in truth. Does this, this doesn't mean being gullible. But it surely means that you will not receive a word from your spouse that you will take with any sort of evil Behind it, you take it in truth, without malice or suspicion. That is the whole part of that holy relationship we were learning about two weeks ago. Nothing to hide one from another. Able to express and open up their hearts to each other. And because they are open together in love, they are no longer ashamed to bring what must be expressed Therefore, they are able to hear one another in truth without doubting the words of their husband or wife. Not that they are infallible in everything they say, but not received with an assumption of evil. And then he goes on to say, love hopes all things. And so love is and does hope all things. Which is always to look forward to to that ultimate good for your marriage partner. Which seeks the ultimate good of your marriage partner. Hoping all things. There is understanding that we are to be optimistic. To pray always for the best of our loved ones. Of our neighbors in this context. <clears throat> and then lastly, love is and does endure all things. And so again, the, this one is a little more stronger. Enduring all things in the context of all assaults, all sufferings, and all hardships that come to threaten your relationship. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, the church with one another, but in our application tonight in our marriages, anything that assaults, anything that causes our sufferings and hardships in our marriages, love endures all of it. And so 
Love then denies all insults, all divisions, all rash and unjust jealousies, everything that may threaten our one flesh bond. Love defends and always working to the ultimate good of your own soul and the soul of your marriage partner. Again, Ephesians 5.29, no man, no one ever hated his own flesh. But what does he do? He nourishes it and cherishes it. And then we remember the words of the Apostle John. We love because he first loved us. Which goes back to the point that I've mentioned earlier. When we behold the love of Christ for us, then we will love excellently. And my encouragement to you as you consider the thoughts of 1 Corinthians 13, and you see again how weak you are and how unable you are to perform, that you remind yourself of your poor and sinful state, undeserving of anything but loved of Christ, chosen of God, washed by His blood, sanctified by Him. And Christ, to, for the ultimate good of His elect, the ultimate good of His bride, dying on the cross. But to justify His love, He would rise again on the third day. To seal and to prove His ultimate love for His people. Brother Gord quoted that earlier, Ephesians 5. <clears throat> the examples in Christ that we love and to, we are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. So in that same pattern of thinking, we are to imitate Him as our primary example to lead us in our own marriages. For in Christ, the greatest demonstration of love, we are able to learn from and are able to live by. Why is it we are so... We are so unable, having great difficulty to bear the shame of our partners, to bear the burdens of our marriage partners. It's because our visions of Christ are always blurred. But you think again of His love for you and how He bore your shame, your annoyances, your great sins, in which we should consider ourselves the chief of all sinners. We consider our great depravity, Christ taking that upon his own shoulders, our depravity, that you may have life in him. And so I encourage you to see him who hung on the cross. His head, his hands, his feet were sorrow and love mingled down, as the hymn says. And why did He do all of this? So that He may present you to the Father in splendor without spot, wrinkle, or blemish and to present you before the Heavenly Father in holiness. Oh, the lengths of Christ's expression to bring you to the Heavenly Father as washed, healed, and forgiven. And so when you desire to quit, and when you act in hatred rather than in love, remember marriage is not meant to be easy. What do you expect? It is a union between two who are imperfect. And naturally bent to do the desires of the flesh, if not mortifying the flesh, always caught in the nat natural desires of the flesh. But always dying as Christ died. Always submitting to the Father as Christ submitted to the Father. Always led of the Holy Spirit as Christ was led of the Holy Spirit. Always in prayer as Christ was always in prayer. That He may always act in love. And Christ did all of that as you think of Him. Now open your eyes as Adam did when he awoke from his sleep. 
and then see the wife or the husband that God has put before you in love. To love. And as you lock your eyes upon that woman or that man that God has given you, remind yourself that God has given this person to demonstrate the very love of Jesus Christ. And though she or he may be so far from it, in an earthly way, Christ would provide that you may be reminded of the love of your Maker. When you look at your husbands and wives, do you see the love of God for your soul? You should. You should. Every time your wife takes care of the children, washes the dishes, prepares the meals when you get home, those should not ever be looked down upon as something light. God demonstrates His love in those things always. And every time you look upon her, every time you look upon Him, in His providing away from home, in His labors for your children and your provisions out of love, every single thing you must consider in each day Everything is done out of love. What encourages the husband to work there, though he sees his clock and he's saying, oh, I'm so tired, it's his wife and his children. What encourages the wife, though she is without sleep, to continue on, it is her love. But I pray that you don't just see it as love for one another, but Christ's love manifested in you, that you would always see His love for your soul. I pray you view your marriages that way. As much as you love your marriage partners, yes, you should, but you should always see Christ in everything they do. Though they may be far from Him and His perfection, but even those simple demonstrations and expressions of love are meant to lead you to view Jesus Christ and see Him who loved your soul until His death. And as He rose again for all of eternity, He loves you. And always remember too, that as you think of the love of Christ, that Christ's love is never fading. Never fading. Always constant. And that what's wonderful about the love of Christ for us is that it extends from eternity to eternity. When He returns for us, we will be welcomed into His love. Even now as we gather and we sing of the Lord Jesus, we sing because He loved us. We weep because of His great love for such a sinner like me, like you. And so as I look at Christ, He encourages my heart to love my wife in that same way as it should be for you husbands and wives. See to it that your love for your wives and husbands are constant, ongoing, never fading. Makes me wonder, what caused Adam and Eve to love one another? Was it just mere attraction? Because that's kind of what we read when you, he wakes up, he sees her, and he says, wow, that's the one. Was it just on the grounds of attraction because she was beautiful? As much as we want to say personality, we know that there was no room to find out her personality at that very moment. Her uniqueness, his uniqueness. Though I'm sure all of these things are important and definitely added on to their love one to another. But I believe with all my heart that what caused Adam and Eve to love one another was that imparted gift of love that came from their maker who instilled love in their hearts. If John tells us that God is love himself, without God in the picture, just leave the two together, there would be no love. But being that God is love himself, he imparts that gift of love to each party of that marriage covenant. 
And what, it, what made it so easy for them to receive one another and to become one flesh is that as Adam looked upon Eve, he saw the very love of his maker who formed him in his image and likeness. When Adam saw his Eve, he saw the love of God for him who provided him the beauties of Eden. And being that Eve just showed up to the scene, she didn't have anything else to recollect than to remember that it was this maker, this God, out of his love, made me in his image and gave me the husband that I am to love. Every time Adam and Eve looked at one another, they saw God's love for them. I believe that with all my heart. For there was nothing else that they knew than God from the beginning. Therefore they were able to live in that one flesh love because they lived in the light of their God. This is before the fall. God was in their midst. God was the one who joined them together. God was the one who brought her to Him. God was always walking with them. They were able to live in one flesh love because God who is love was always in their view. And this is the will of God in our marriages. And this is only possible if man, if a man be born again. He then will be restored to that right thinking, that right heart that is renewed by the Holy Spirit of God. Only if a man be born again, only if a man repent of his sins genuinely and see and believe the Lord Jesus Christ who died for him. Only then you will understand. Why do I say that? Because Paul says, I tell you, this mystery is profound and it refers to Christ and his church. You will not understand the fullness of the marriage covenant unless you have been redeemed by the one who came to redeem his church. And if you are redeemed, you have all, you have been given the blessing, rather, of seeing what it means to be loved by a perfect Savior. And so go home and pray to the Lord. Seek His forgiveness at your lack that He may lead you and enable you to great expressions and practices of love for the maintenance of your marriage covenant. And that when the world looks upon your marriage, it will be a great display of Jesus and his church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you tonight for giving us these words. And yes, it may be elementary to some, but the words that we ought to hear should always meditate upon every day. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves, then really it's worth us to examine whether we are lovers of God, lovers of our neighbors, and most importantly for the married, that they would consider their love for their wives and husbands. That you would provide a suitable companion to be a mark of your love from creation and now in Christ Jesus as he came. No wonder then you have patterned your return to a wedding where the bridegroom will come and will take his bride for himself, married on the grounds of the shed blood of Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us in love. So teach us, Lord, we pray as we wait for the arrival of our husband, the Lord Jesus, that in our earthly marriages we would reflect him. And because he loved us, we, O oh Lord, pray that you would enable us to love our spouses, to overlook all weaknesses, all limitations, all irritations, all annoyances, but to wash, to cleanse, to forgive, to point always to the Lord. Sanctify our marriages, O God, 
that you would receive the utmost glory. Sanctify them, Lord, that even in this way the husband and the wife would see your great love for them. Thank you, O Lord, that you have loved us so much in Christ Jesus that these today could even experience the marriage relationship and see in the earthly sense that perfect love of Christ and then demonstrate it one to another. Teach us, we pray. Lead us, we pray. Sanctify us until you come. In Jesus' name, amen.